yeah. tell us you've got yeah. some charts about what rising interest rates have done to borrowing capacity. So what have, yeah, what have yeah, they done? Sure. I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about this. Um, talking about lending and property is pretty much my favorite subject. Um, I can oh, talk about it all day. I do it all the time. So happy to, can I share my screen? Yeah, yeah, jump in. And I think this is one you put together a couple of months ago. So this may even be, may even be sort of even more pronounced. Yeah. So look, a, a little bit, this is a little bit um, dated, but the data is realized now. So a, a little while ago, I came up with like, I wanted to test the idea, do borrowing capacities predict where house prices will go in Sydney? Mm. So yep. that, that's just like a little soft sense test that I use to work out fair valuations for assets and things like that. Well, what I saw Solid was... Premise. Sorry? Solid premise. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, was, it was just a question that I was asking myself. And I'm like, look, it's actually really hard to do this data properly. Like, I need to actually go through live customers over a five, 10 year journey. And the only way you do that is if you have servicing calcs and you run actual servicing calcs and have an understanding of uh, how banks apply these servicing calcs at different points in time. Um, so yeah, I, I ran the modeling on that. So we ran it on a, I think it was on a high income couple um, and just sort of looked at what can one person borrow year in, year out over 2017 to 2021. Um, and what it showed is from 2017 to 2018, there was a bit of a borrowing power drop. House prices fell too. Um, that was, you know, at the time, regulatory issues, Royal Commission, assets and things like that. And then five years, over the next five years, there's been, um, you know, a whole range of regulatory changes that help um, uh, support borrowing capacities and rate cuts that occurred in 2019, um, APRA changes and tax cuts that occurred in 2019. And what we saw is borrowing powers shot up and so did house prices. Um, so... That was like the starting point um, of the research being like, look, there's a previous relationship that's existed over the past five years. Um, so what does that mean going forward? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm still on, guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're still on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just got, yeah, we just got the, the, main, the main chart up on the screen. The, the interesting thing, um, have, have, you, have you looked at, have you, you probably haven't crunched the data from 2022, yep. I imagine? What, what is it sort I, of? I, I have, I have. So oh. the... This research was done when rates began rising in twenty in what May June twenty twenty two. So all of this, the reason why I did this chart was to show that hey, borrowing capacities have a relationship with house prices. So at least in Sydney, because um, this was based on this this is Sydney house price data, Sydney house price median data. So um, that if that relationship exists. I know that in 2022 that there's a big borrowing power drop that's about to happen. So this is this has already happened. Mm -hmm. um, borrowing capacities have fallen 30% now, um, even more for investors, but fallen ballpark 30%. Um, so uh, I, I, we did this um, for the AFR this uh, last week, but the, the high level wow. statistics is if you had a $200,000 income, in 2022, in this time last year, um, a household income of $200,000, you could, with a 10% deposit, you could be buying around that $1.5 million mark, um, which is a sort of golden number in Sydney at the moment with the first-time buyer changes. To get the same borrowing amount today, one year later, mm -hmm. you need a $260,000 income. So to navigate these 30% drop in borrowing capacities, you need a 30% increase in income to just borrow the same amount. Um, right. So... Yeah, this chart shows that borrowing capacities fell by 30% in 2022. It's it's a little bit dated. I, I like I didn't know what the cash rate would be at the time, but you know, it's You're pretty close though. So, yeah, I ran a few different scenarios. This is the worst case scenario here. It's beyond that. It's 3.6 with a cash rate 3.6%. Um so the, the total <laughs> drop is about 30% in borrowing capacity that's occurred. Um so house prices haven't fallen by that much. House prices fell by about 15% in Sydney. Um but what it does show is like if you Look at the direction. Oh, oops. If you look at the direction of this chart, like it's like down in 2017 to 2018, house prices are up in these years and then down again. It's the same direction of how house prices have moved. So Sydney house prices are moving along with borrowing capacity. So it's a little bit of a predictor. So if you can predict what happens to the borrowing capacities, you may have some insights into what happens to house prices. So that, that's kind okay. of why I did research. Um, what, how do you, what, what is the, what is the definition of borrowing capacity? Uh, so, you know, when, whenever someone goes out to get a loan, um, the bank determines how much that person could go and can get a loan for. Um, 
to do that, they check their income, they subtract all their expenses, um, yep. and whatever's left over, you can borrow against that like monthly leftover amount that you have, and you can borrow yeah. a multiple of that. Um, so that that's your borrowing capacity. Um, so uh, for investors, it's particularly important because they need borrowing capacity to purchase their investments. That's crazy that it went from what 1.9 million to two point, and this was on, was this on a 200k income? Was it? It's a household combined income, a 2017 level of a. So wage growth is part of these calcs. Um, so in 2017, it's two people, it's a couple earning 160 grand each. Um, ah, it's so, free 20, free and and um, so why do you think these two are linked? Why are borrowing capacities and, and at least Sydney house prices linked like this? Uh, to buy a home in Sydney, um, you need to. Get, most people need to go and get a loan to go and get that mm. property. So, and we find working with a lot of Sydney borrowers is that a lot of the time to buy a home, borrowers need to stretch towards their maximums to get something that they want. Um, and even if, and they often adjust their locations and budgets based around their borrowing capacities. So, if you give someone thirty percent more money, um, we find that Sydney siders often take that thirty percent more money and then just move from you know uh, instead of buying in Tempe, I'd buy in Marrickville, or like I'd buy in the in the like slightly higher area, higher priced area because you know I could live there now, so I, I'll go and do that. Um, so I think that's the link between the two. Um, you know, just. The amount of money you get from a bank can increase your budget and hence prices move along with borrowing capacities or had had. If, if they were able to get more interest rates went up, um, you would see prices go down based on, on that. But what if the banks decided to increase serviceability and borrowing capacity for people? Like they came up with a more creative way and um, would that change anything? Would that? Yeah, for sure. So within this chart itself, oh, let me go back to it. So within these charts, am I back? Yep. So yep, yep. within these charts itself, every year, these numbers, these dot points that are here includes changes to bank policies that occurred at the time to improve mm -hmm. or like negatively impact serviceability. We mm -hmm. also ran future charts as to to answer this sort of question, what if banks change their policies? So um, one of the charts that we ran was um, currently uh, the prudential regulator, the person who sets the rules, the, the regulator who sets the rules on how banks lend money. Um, so that's called APRA, the Australian Prudential Regulator. Uh, regulation authority. Um, this is, it's kind of like the, the policeman for Aussie banks that says you must do this when you lend money out. Um, they set yeah. the rule. Now, they, they have what's called a 3% assessment buffer. So that means that if you go and get a loan at 6% um, or 5%, the banks need to assume that the interest rate is 3% above whatever you're paying to in the assessment of how much you can borrow. So to work out what you can afford, they kind of assume that the interest rate is 8% if you're paying 5 to work out your borrowing capacity. What can you afford if interest rates were 8%? So that's a 3% buffer. Um, there's yep. talks of reducing that buffer back down to 2%. Um, and if it did do that, then it would boost borrowing powers um, quite substantially. Um, but I'm, I'm very interested about your interest rates are going to stop. That's kind of the, like, they're going to just pause here for a little bit. But that's your kind of prediction of where we're going to go. Um, well, the market's prediction, isn't it? I don't that's know about market, rhythm, Well, the market, yeah. sorry, sorry, the market. <laughs> and, I mean, the market's a good one to follow um, because... That's a better one, yeah, it, for me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what, what impact do you think that's going to have on the on the property market? What's that going to look like in, in, in your opinion? you got a graph here, do you? Uh, got a graph. I, I, I don't... Uh, well, well, we, can, we, can show, we can talk about the chart. Answering that question, it's it's hard to tell because financial conditions yeah. are very tight. Like it's not like not changing. If they don't, if they leave the interest rate at three point six percent, which is where it's at at the moment, to so borrow rates are early fives now, five point two five ballpark um, for an owner occupier, and closer to six for an investor, especially with an yeah. interest only loan. Um, so yeah. those interest rates are dramatically higher than where they were, you know, twelve months ago. So much much higher. Yeah. So even if they don't increase the interest rate any further, it's interest rates remain quite high relative to 12 months ago. Um, yeah. So that, and borrowing capacities are 
in in the chart that I just had, if you look at it, it's at a like a 2018 low point. Um, so financial conditions are very tight. Um, so we're going to be operating in that environment for the next few months, most likely at least, unless there's more bank collapses and then interest rates get cut. But, um, you know, and um, so you, you, what you just mentioned there, um, why why would a bank messing up in the US mean interest rates in Australia? Let's say banks start to mess up all around. Like, why, why does that impact interest rates? Yeah, I, I, we, uh, we had a good talk about this, actually. So oh, the perfect. idea is um, central banks want to slow the economy down. They want to slow things uh, down. They're willing to batter it a little bit, but they don't want things to break. Um, and mm -hmm. the thing that scares them more than anything is financial stability issues. Um, yeah. That is a bigger risk than, it's probably the only thing that I can think of that's actually a bigger risk than inflation in the short term. Um, they can't be put in a situation where um, the financial system uh, itself and borrowers are at risk and credit supply just stops. Um that is a real like economy risk um, and central banks are afraid of that. Mm. So that is why interest and what's causing this is and underlying the, the bank collapse uh, in the US, uh, if interest rates didn't rise and remained really, really low, then that bank wouldn't have collapsed. But when banks, when interest rates start rising, you start finding out which banks have made poor decisions, um, which businesses mm. aren't doing yeah. as well. And, um, you know, you've lifted the hurdle rates a bit higher. So, um that is why it slows down interest rate increases because bank central banks are afraid of financial stability consequences of um, banks falling over, really. Can we have bank runs? Can this thing happen here? Like, what are your thoughts on that? No, no not with our major banks. Um, it's very unlikely. We have the most well-capitalized banks in the world. Um, so mm -hmm. basically, our regulator makes sure that our banks are very, very safe don't take on much risk um, and have huge buffers in place. The downside to this is we pay more for, we have, we've got a, a bigger spread, if that makes sense. So we pay more for yeah, our mortgages as a spread. result, but we have very safe banks. So our regulator ensures that we have a huge insurance policy in case of instability. And whenever there's instability around, you know, our banks are so strong. They're unquestionably strong. That's the benchmark that they use. Um, so the risk of this sort of thing happening in Australia is very, very low. Um, and again, if it did happen, then our central bank would come in with that level of backstop too. Um, they're not going to just let depositors uh, lose their money. What is happening? Interest rates are going to pause. That's your kind of assumption or what the market is, is saying here. Um, and the market um yeah what's going to happen in 2024 <laughs> so uh again going back to the initial mm -hmm. bits of the conversation our borrowing power is a predictor of what's going to happen next so previously they have been and even now they have like 2022 2023 house prices fell 15 percent. that's one of the biggest house price falls in 40 years unsurprisingly borrowing capacities fell 30 percent during that period so mm. uh the, the quantum isn't right, but the size and direction, uh, the direction is right. Um, so what happens in 2024 is uh, a few different things help support borrowing powers. Um, so these things are not talked about, not that well understood. Um, and people probably care more about 2024 in 2024. But <laughs> investors are not buying property for in 2023 to generate a return in 2023. It's, it's generally not what investors do. They're buying returns over a three, five, 10, 20 year horizon. Um, so what does it look like um, in 2024? So whenever interest rates cap out and stop rising, if they do, um, then you'll have the trough in borrowing powers. Um, so that's mm. this little point that we've modeled here. It's probably a little yep. bit lower now, so somewhere around here. Um, so what happens next is Next year, there's a few things that are going to happen, likely to happen, that's going to support borrowing powers. Um, so if the cash rate broadly remains the same as where it is now, it's 3.5%, 3.6%, so broadly remains the same, then the yeah. tax cuts that are in place that begin 1 July 2024 will lead to a 9% increase in borrowing power. Um, so this is because... This, this is for investors, right, Rodan? 
Nick? So this is modeling out. A, a business? Yeah, this is modeling out a, a couple buying a home in right. Sydney. Um, okay. Investors will feel the same thing. Then just percentages will be different. The numbers will be different, okay. but the direction yeah, yeah, yeah. will be the same. Um, yep. So, uh, you know, an investor like borrowing powers begin to rise again next year because of tax cuts. The tax cuts alone make up nearly 9% of the borrowing power improvement, which is quite material. Like, you know, it could it's easily ridiculous. lead to... Yeah. You can, like it's it's a big tax cut that people have. So, you know, you need like three years of wage growth. Like if you're earning a decent wage, 150, 160 grand, um, now you need like three years of standard pay increases to make up this same tax cut. Um, you can yeah. either just wait three years and get pay, like little inflation adjustments to your salaries, or you can just get the government to give you more money in your bank account every every month, every week, or whenever you get paid. So um, that that's what's driving that improvement. Um, tax cuts, um, and if you have rate cuts back to one and a half percent, which is more than what it was in 2021 when it was zero, if, if rates are cut, you know, down to one and a half percent, let's say inflation goes away, the economy slows down and the central bank begins cutting rates. If they cut rates to one and a half percent, to be honest, like our modeling shows, there's only one response to that and it's boom. Like, you know, the house prices will most likely, if the economy remain solid and people are in jobs, um, which might be a little bit contrary, but as long as people are in jobs and can afford to buy a home, um, then you'll find that borrowing capacity shoot up a lot, depending on how low the cash rate goes. Um, uh, that's partly wage rises, tax cuts, um, APRA changing that buffer to 3% to 2%. Um, uh, so some of these things we kind of expect to happen through the year um, that improve borrowing capacities. Um, and once that does happen, then you'll find we're probably at the trough of borrowing capacities around now, and it's going to improve at some point next year. So, so you've kind of, you're kind of calling the, the bottom for the next, you know, six, six months, would you say six to 12 months, six to 12 months? Yeah. We, <laughs> There's some uncertainty to that because I, I did caveat Oops. with as long as the economy and people remain in jobs. So throughout all of these experiences, even from 2017, mm. um, there was no recession, I mean, excluding the COVID temporary period, but there was no like mm. big economic recession that occurred where unemployment went up substantially. So um, what that means is when people are in jobs, this relationship holds. But if we have 10% unemployment and no one's in a job, it doesn't matter what banks are giving people. Like, mm -hmm. you know, people, people need to be in a job to go, go and get this borrowing power. So um, that's part of the story too. One question I just wanted to ch ask about, uh, ask to you is, um, how do you look at the the zoning? So you were talking about, let's say we're going to buy in South Australia. Um, they have different zonings, like they have everywhere else. Um, they have something called high de um, high diversity neighbourhood, right? That's that's one to really look out for because it means that they're going hell for leather to make that bit better. Now, do you invest in areas that have already been rezoned? This place here is high density neighbourhood, or do you say, hey, opposite the street here? There's a shopping centre on this side, high density neighbourhood here. Um, I believe this area is going to be where it's at. But what, how do you kind of think about that? Sure. So we don't like. I'm not skilled enough to take advantage of high density zoning myself. Like, what am I going to do? I can't. Like, I like working in my office. I I don't like going out on sites and and building myself. Um, so uh, I. We, we do that sort of strategy element where it's buy things that are undervalued today that may mm -hmm. change a little bit later. Um, it's like Moneyball in sports where you're buying like a, a, a person or, a, or, or an asset that looks a certain way but produces more over time because the way you look at it will change um, because it's zoning changes or something like that. Um, so, in other, so in other words, you wouldn't want Liverpool to buy Cristiano Ronaldo at the moment. He's he's uh, he's he's yeah. definitely not undervalued, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Liverpool adopt this strategy. My football team definitely adopt this sort of strategy in the transfer market. Um, they don't have any money, so they they, they have to do something like this. Um, New South, like in New South Wales, it's better if you can understand planning changes. Um, so change in planning is the key if you can understand that in your city in the cities you're operating you know investing in that's what i would be doing um so if i was investing in perth i would be doing every i'd, I'd apply my same sydney mindset my same sydney learnings in perth and understand try to understand as quickly as i can 
how their planning arrangements work and what changes in planning may occur. Um, New South Wales was like, I, I said it at the time, um, was the biggest opportunity for smallest small resi developers in decades occurred a couple of years ago um, in New South Wales because there was a statewide, so for the entire New South Wales, um, the state came up with these rules to build duplexes and triplexes. Was that, CD, and, was that CDC compliant yeah, development? CDC. Hmm. Yeah, so at the time, this, this was new. Um, so what we did, just before it came out, like COVID, hmm. COVID did hit, no one knew about it. We went and bought a whole range of assets just that would benefit from this. And next thing you know, the value of these assets after we got plans on them and getting plans via CDC is very easy, very quick. The value of these assets and the certainty of plans increased dramatically and beat the market return over that time because of these planning changes. So if you can understand planning changes in the city you're looking at, maybe you can benefit from that. Um, so that's something that if I was investing in, I would overlay um, on top of the macro data days on listings and stuff like that. I'd be focusing on the micro.